right, so welcome everyone to the AI and Big Data and Finance webinar. Um, we're very delighted to have two distinguished speakers today. So Antoinette Shore from MIT will present her paper, Are Cryptos Different? Evidence from Retail Trading. And then Ale Chivinsky from Yale University uh, will be the discussant. And um, Antoinette will have uh, 30 minutes for the presentation. And then after about uh, 15 minutes, I'll, I'll briefly interrupt you just if there are any clarification questions um, from the audience. And then after the, the 30 minutes, Ale will have uh, 20 minutes uh, for his discussion, and then we'll open the floor uh, to the general audience uh, for, for broader discussion. Um, so for the members in the audience, uh, please submit your questions in the Q&A, and I will then call on you during the questioning part. And just as a reminder, please be respectful with your comments. Uh, the presentation and discussion is recorded and will be posted together with the slides on our website. Um, so after the main part of the webinar, uh, so roughly 50 minutes, we'll have an unrecorded discussion where everyone will be upgraded to panelists and um, then, then we can chat a little bit more uh, time permitting. So with all of that being said, uh, Antoinette, the floor is yours. Great, thank you very much, Andy, and thank you everyone for coming. Um, let me share my screen. Uh, blue. Can you see this full screen? Yep, perfect. Um, so yes, yeah, so this um, paper we call uh, Are Cryptos Different? This is joint work with uh, Shimon Kogan, Igor Makarov, and Marina Niesner. Um, and the short answer is uh, yes, uh, cryptos seem to be a bit different in retail investors' minds. And I will show you now um, what this is all about. So the motivation for this work um, is relatively simple. Uh, we have seen over the more than a decade now, right, that cryptocurrencies have become um, much more prevalent. Um, it seems to more and more become an emerging asset class um, where many retail investors in particular are participating. And however, there is still a lot of um, discussion. What are the sources of valuation um, of cryptocurrencies? And in particular, right, this question is seem to be um, never ending because in addition to you know the the wider adoption of cryptocurrencies we still see a lot of um up and down movements in the valuation of cryptocurrencies i'm just plotting um, you know here the bitcoin price for you uh, this has then of course given rise to a lot of different ideas of what investors are valuing in cryptocurrencies. And I'm you know, highlighting two very prevalent ones. Um, of course, many people have said it's just a speculative asset that um, investors are, especially retail traders, are getting into, um, in some, some, some sense, you know, maybe bet and speculate. And it has even given rise to new um, investment means like FOMO, fear of missing out, and so on. Um, but then, you know, there are other views on what drives the valuation of cryptocurrencies, in particular, um, the idea that investors are betting or basically speculating on a wider adoption of cryptocurrencies as a potentially a store of value or, you know, a payment mechanism. And here the idea, um, to some extent, is that uh, you know, the, the wider the adoption that might then lead to network externalities that then, you know, these type of externalities feed on themselves. And what we want to do in this, in this paper is to use um, information from retail investor trades to, um, to speak basically to these different uh, valuation models and um, to you know, more, more concisely, what we ask here is um, how retail investors um, trading, uh, what it suggests about how these investors update about price expectation in cryptocurrencies versus other types of assets, um, such as stocks and commodities. And as I will show you, what is nice in the data that we have is that we can observe the individual trades of uh, retail investors at the trade level, 
But in addition to seeing people's crypto trades, we also see for the same investor um, their investments in, uh, you know, kind of the more traditional asset classes such as stocks, um, commodities um, such as gold, and then crypto. And just to give you, you know, kind of a preview of what I will show you um, in the rest of the the talk is um, there is there seems to be a big difference in how the you know this holding constant the same set the same investors we see that um, they are trading in stocks and gold in a quite contrarian way so this has been shown in, by by other people in other data um, sets as well so um, you know when there's a uh, and run up in in the price of particular stocks um, in retail traders seem to trade against this in contrast we find so we find the same thing for our for our the people in our data set but we do we see that in crypto these same people um, trade crypto currencies in a more momentum like fashion meaning that they seem to be um, not actively trading contrarian against uh, price movements and if anything right they are holding um, through price run-ups and um, and drops and then what we do um, you know kind of uh, building on this is we then investigate um, whether there are differences and in a way whether there is um, heterogeneity um, in trading behavior by investor characteristics um, and what I will show you is there is there are slight differences, but surprisingly, actually, um, cross-sectional personal heterogeneity doesn't seem to actually explain much at all about um, this, you know, kind of uh, asymmetry in how uh, retail investors trade in crypto versus the more traditional asset classes. And then I will also show you how um, dimensions such as information about cash flows, lack of experience with past um, crashes, um, a lottery type returns and so on. Um, all these dimensions do not seem to explain uh, the this discrepancy that, that um, we found again between um, crypto and, and uh, traditional assets. So given that, you know, kind of, uh, um, before I show you the the specifications, I want to just be clear about how our data looks like. It will make it much easier than for me to explain to you, um, you know, how the whole paper is set up, right? Um, so we have trading data from a large international discount broker called eToro. You can think of eToro a little bit like um, Robin Hood for the rest of the world. Um, I mean, for initially for non-US so much. Um, and we have data from 2015 to 2019. Um, this uh, eToro was founded in 2007, um, but was one of the earliest platforms that allowed people to also trade crypto. Um, and what we observe for the investors on eToro is we observe their demographic ca characteristics, including um, where they are located, but also, you know, their income, their um, their occupation, their age, their gender, and so on. Um, in addition, we see, and that's obviously the more important part here, we see all their trades time stamped. Um, and then we, in addition, we see their portfolio daily balances across the different asset classes. And what I will, what we will focus on here is, um, as I said, on stocks, and there we take the 200 most traded stocks, but this is really most of the daily volume on eToro, but you can think of these 200 largest, you know, most traded stocks as the typical most traded stocks um, that retail investors have, you know, everything from Amazon, Tesla, Apple, and so on. Um, then we have information on crypto trades, and there the, the, the three cryptocurrencies that, again, make most of the volume on eToro are Bitcoin, Ripple, and Ethereum. And then I will show you also trades in gold. Um, gold is one of the, sorry, gold is one of the most, you, most traded crypt, uh, con commodity on, um, on eToro. The second most is um, 
uh, 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 forex currencies, but we didn't use forex here because, as I will show you now, the, the sample is relatively international. And so with forex, right, you then don't know how much of this is pure speculation versus maybe people hedging, you know, kind of some uh, some other uh, forex exposure they have. That's why we abstracted from uh, from uh, forex here. But um, just to give you a quick sense of how our data looks like, so we have information on 200, about 200,000 unique retail investors on eToro. As you can see, um, th this looks very similar to other discount broker platforms. Um, the sample skews relatively, let me say, youngish, <laughs> given that probably you know people in their 30s is still somewhat young. Um, so, you know, kind of, so th this um, is the age breakdown at, you know, this is, again, not so surprisingly, it's, it, it skews very male, um, very few women on this platform. And then you can see, right, that um, eToro, as I said, um, started initially, um, in particular in Europe and, um, you know, kind of, uh, yeah, I mean, in Europe and a little bit in Asia and only actually post the hour sample period. Um, did they push it into the US, right? So this is, um, you know, kind of relatively international. And then, you know, again, here, this, um, you know, kind of what I want to show you, because that's important for a lot of the tests that we will be doing. Um, the majority of the investors invest both in cryptocurrencies and stocks. Um, and also in commodities, but there are some people who only invest in crypto or only invest in stocks. And for today, the most of what I will be showing you is for the set of investors where I observe, you know, basically that who invest in both so that I can observe their crypto trades and all their, their more traditional investments. Um, I, I will point out, you know, kind of it, in the end, interestingly, we, we find that, um, this discrepancy in or asymmetry in the trading behavior in crypto versus the rest um, is, as you will see, very strong in these investors that trade in both. But the same is, you know, it holds even for the people that just invest in one versus the other. Cool. So then finally, you know, um, again, right, remember these are, you can think of them, you know, as retail trading in. Um, you know, kind of these discount brokerage um, accounts that, um, you know, kind of that looks very similar to say, you know, what people have found um, using, you know, the NASDAQ retail trade activity tracker. It also looks very similar. Um, you know, we did a bunch of tests, which I will spare you here um, to, to show that the type of stocks and the type of trading behavior um, that we observe for the eToro investors look very similar to what, um, you know, kind of you can see for um, Robinhood. But, you know, just to, you know, be clear, right, you can see that um, the typical, I mean, there are some investors who trade a lot, but many people actually trade relatively sporadically. They trade in, you know, at the medium at least, right, in a few stocks. Um, and the size of the trades is, you know, kind of somewhat smallish, let's say, you know, kind of between 200 and 300 um, dollars, right? So all this is very similar to, to other discount brokerage platforms. All right, so with this, right, um, let me now tell you what indeed we do, right? What we, as I said, what we want to understand is how um, retail traders update about the value of cryptocurrencies and how they form expectations um, about, cryptocurrency, about cryptocurrency returns. Um, and we built on uh, prior work by Calvell, Campbell, and Sodini, um, the 2009 paper, um, to build um, as an outcome measure. What we look at is how changes in the total portfolio share um, of uh, these retail investors um, respond to um, co concurrent and past uh, returns of the, um, the relevant 
uh, you know, kind of uh, assets um, or the, the relative stocks and, and cryptos. And so, you know, just to be very clear, right, so the outcome variable we will be looking at, um, the first one is basically what we call total portfolio share change. So that's basically the, you know, shares owned in a particular stock. Um, times the the price um, as a as a fraction of overall wealth and how this changes from day to day from period to period, um, and then we break. But of course, right as you obviously can see, this depends on the active rebalancing decision of the investor times the passive price appreciation. Um, and so, what we also then do is to look at um, how investors change their portfolio allocation actively, meaning you know how they rebalance, we then form this um, active portfolio share change variable that abstracts from the price appreciation and literally just looks at how the owner um, actively rebalanced. Um, and you know I will come back to this in a little bit, but of course this um, why this is also a helpful variable um, is that it allows you it allows us to isolate um, the active rebalancing decisions of, of traders because you, you know, if you just look at total portfolio share change, um, you might worry that um, you know, many decisions might be just passively driven by investors maybe not paying attention um, to, uh, to what's going on in their portfolio and, and therefore just you know, ret differential return. Um, driving their portfolio, right? And so this will be something um, we will look at, um, you know, by using this active portfolio share change, but also actually, as you will see, by using other metrics um, of attention and inattention that people are paying to their portfolio. Now, let me say one thing before I show you the results. Um, the you know kind of we have individual trades for every investor, but as I showed you before in the descriptive statistics, um, these individual investors here trade quite or many of them at least trade very sporadically. So they have long inactivity periods, um, and that seem very idios very idiosyncratic. Um, again, this is true for you know any type of. Um, discount broker platform that people have looked at. And the the difficulty with this then is always to um, to differentiate whether, you know, is inactivity per se a sign of up updating by, right, uh, basically an active updating by these investors, um, you know, so basically are they sitting there monitoring the market but saying, I am deciding not to trade, or, right, are they just forgetting about the fact that they have some money sitting in a discount broker um, and, and therefore it means actually nothing, right? And therefore it might introduce a ton of noise, um, idiosyncratic noise that we don't necessarily want. Um, so therefore what we did here is we constructed portfolios of various subsets of users. What I mean with this, what we basically did, you can think of this almost as, um, you know, kind of a way to aggregate the meaningful variation within different um, subsets of users while averaging out these idiosyncratic inactivity spells. And, you know, kind of, so what we do in the paper, and you will see when I now show you the results, um, we, can, we can build basically these portfolios at the overall sample level and then basically create the an equivalent of basically a representative investor. But we can, of course, and that's what we also do, is we can create representative investors at a very decent, at a very granular level. Say, you know, kind of a, um, a representative investor of someone who is um, say young, lower income, and female, or right, um, older has a finance background and male, right? So in in some sense, we can be as granular as we want in these aggregation, but in a way also aggregate more. The way we think about you know this type of ex exercise is that these type of aggregate portfolios allow us to abstract from 
this idiosyncratic noise while um, preserving the meaningful variation in our data. And, you know, in kind of an asset pricing, I would say you guys, because in my day-to-day -day activities, I'm less of an asset pricer, right? But, you know, kind of there's obviously a long history of building um, portfolios at the stock level as well in order to get rid of a lot of idiosyncratic noise. Um, you get, in the paper, we then also actually look at um, repeat all the analysis at the disaggregated level, um, so at the trade by trade level, and the results will go through. But as you would not be surprised, but it's a bit noisier because indeed you have a lot of this idiosyncratic noise. All right. So with this, let me then see. Let me then show you um, what we find. Um, and again, right, this is now using um, individual trades aggregated to these um, representative um, investor uh, cohorts or portfolios, um, but focusing on investors who trade in both crypto and uh, more traditional asset classes. And, um, you know, kind of just to, again, repeat, right, our left, our dependent variable is the, um, in the first panel here, is the log of the total share change in a given asset. So, you know, kind of, in, if you look here at the observations, right, why are there 170,000? It's because, as I told you, in stocks, we have 200 different stocks um, that these investors invest in, um, or that the typical investor invests in and what you can and basically what we then look at is the the share the share change um in a different in a particular asset regressed on um log returns contemporaneous returns and then you know kind of one week past one month past three months past and so on but what you see if you focus say on the first column here is that in stocks, the total share change is slightly negative, um, so it's slightly contra contrarian in response to, you know, kind of past returns. That's true even if we break it out into, you know, kind of positive versus negative returns, um, so quite symmetric um, on both sides of the return distribution. And however, then if you look into the, if you look at the active share, share change, what you see is that um, this total share change being slightly negative um, is driven by um, very active and contrarian um, uh, rebalancing in, in the portfolio. In other words, you know, what, what we see is that um, these retail investors actively trade against um, past, uh, sorry, uh, against contemporaneous um, increases in the stock price okay and this is exactly why you know kind of we say that in stocks um, these investors are contrarian now if you do the same thing for our investors in cryptos you see a very different result right so um same analysis but now just for for remember this is bitcoin ripple and ethereum what you see is that there's very little active rebalancing, right? Um, so that's basically, it's negative, but it's it's ultimately zero. Um, but because, but um, because there's little, um, you know, kind of active rebalances thing, we see that um, on, on net there for on the total share change, we see um, very positive and basically momentum like, um, you know, changes in the total share, in um, as a function of of past of of contemporaneous returns and very little actually you know on on the lagged um, returns yeah so this is basically this uh, large discrepancy between uh, between the, the different um, the different asset classes now let me show you, you can say you know kind of and this is why we were interested in looking at gold um, you know many people say cryptos are um, cryptocurrencies might become digital gold, but actually gold, people don't trade like crypto. In fact, um, if anything, in, in gold, we see that these uh, retail traders are even more contrarian than in stocks. So you see, right, very active negative, um, you know, kind of rebalancing out of 
um, bold after um, you know pri po uh, positive returns, um, and of course the the other way around after negative returns, and then um, you can see that um, because the rebalancing is you know very um, significant uh, economically significant, it also means that um, the total share change um, ends up being very strongly um, contrarian. All right. So let me then, you know, given that we have quite limited time, let me then tell you, you know, kind of, so this is in a way our main finding, that there's this um, very significant asymmetry in how investors seem to be updating about the price of cryptocurrencies in response to past returns, um, where they are much more momentum-like, while in gold and in stocks, um, they are quite they are quite contrarian. Now, you know, in some sense, what then we want to understand is, is that somehow driven by particular subsets of the population or by, by particular events? Um, in terms of events, right, um, what we uh, looked at is whether, say, days with very extreme returns um, are driving this discrepancy. You might be worried that, you know, cryptocurrencies maybe had some, you know, kind of days, um, you know, where there was, uh, where there were very large, you know, either drops or increases in the price. Um, this um, is not the case, um, as um, you can see here, right? So it's not somehow um, that our crypto results um, or the asymmetry between our crypto and, and uh, traditional um, results on stocks and gold um, are driven by particular dates. Um, the other thing that was is very important here is, you know, that might be in your in the back of your mind is, could it still somehow be driven by inattention? Now, I showed you that these are the same investors, right? If they're inattentive, in general, you would think they should be inattentive in stocks. But, you know, in if they're inattentive in crypto, they should be also inattentive in stocks. Um, but, you know, you might still think, well, you know, maybe there's something funky in how they are inattentive. Um, by the way, just as an aside, the way this eToro platform works is that once you log in to see any part of your portfolio, you're seeing all parts of your portfolio. So you cannot, you know, kind of close your eyes to your crypto part and just look at your um, at your stock uh, part of your portfolio. But we can do better than, you know, arguing with you. And what we can do is basically we can look at people who, where we see that they're logging into their portfolio consistently, which we call the active investors. And then we can, you know, kind of separate those investors from what we call non-active investors, meaning people who, um, you know, log into their portfolio um, less frequency than 30 days, right? So anyone who logs in less um, frequently than every 30 days, at least we call inattentive, and people who trade at least um, once every seven days, we call active or attentive. And what you can see, not surprisingly, right, is the, the truly non-active investors, they are a momentum on everything. They are momentum in crypto. They are also momentum in stocks. Makes sense, right? Because they don't rebalance, so their portfolio gets moved around by whatever the whatever the relative um, prices are doing. But for the active investors, those ones that you know we no lock into their portfolio, you can see for them this asymmetry is very stark, and they are the ones driving the asymmetry that I showed you. And so that ultimately means that the asymmetry in trading behavior that we are showing you is not a function of inattention. Actually, it seems to be quite deliberate, right? Um, we can do this even, you know, say for people who, you know, on the day that they log in and trade, um, and again, you know, this asymmetry for the attentive or active investor um, maintains. All right. In the interest of being on time, let me then, whoops, very quickly say that, um, you know, as I already argued to you, what everything I showed you is conditional on holding this, the same investors fixed. And so this is a within-person discrepancy in how, or asymmetry in how they're trading. Um, 
But we were also just interested in general to, to see whether, say, you know, kind of there is cross-sectional heterogeneity in how some investors trade, say, you know, maybe, um, you know, at the margin, women or people with less financial background or poorer people might trade, um, you know, slightly different from the average investor in our sample. Interestingly, you know, I don't have time to show you this, take it for me and if you're interested look at the paper right but there is actually virtually no difference in how women poorer versus richer younger versus older people trade um, and in particular there's no difference in this asymmetry in which they are trading um, we find at the margin that the people who say that i mean who uh, say that they're working in finance um, trade a little bit more momentum in crypto, but it's not, you know, you know, economically very different. So to us, it was very interesting that um, everything I just showed you really doesn't seem to be driven by a composition impact in who trades what, but it's really something about that investors, even the same investors, um, think about the price um, process of cryptocurrencies quite differently from that of, um, um, of stocks. And so, you know, kind of let me um, just quickly conclude. Um, we do a bunch of other robustness tests, but, you know, kind of that's for another venue. So what I hope I have shown you is that investors, these retail investors follow momentum strategies in cryptocurrencies, but contrarian strategies in stocks. Um, and this is not driven by somehow compositional um, differences in investor types who trade in crypto versus stocks. Um, it's also not driven by demographics and in particular not driven by inattention. So what we think is going on here is that um, in cryptocurrencies, when people see, say, a positive price movement, not only do they think, oh, there was a positive price movement concurrently, but they seem to actually see this as a sign of um, higher likelihood that cryptocurrencies will be further adopted in the future, which then, of course, might lead to more trading and volume in crypto and might increase the price even more. In a way, you know, they are trading on maybe a belief of these network externalities that come with more adoption. And then of course the opposite when they see the price dropping. All right, thank you very much. Wonderful, thank you so much Antoinette for this uh, fantastic talk. And um, I will now hand it over to Ale for his discussion. All right. So I'm very happy to uh, to give the discussion. I thank the organizers for for this uh, seminar. It's a very nice public good that you folks are doing to enlarge the community and uh, for Antoinette to um, uh, for an opportunity to discuss such a thought provoking and interesting paper. So first, of all, I want to say that uh, this discussion is not just me, but uh, two of my co-authors, Nicola Bori and Yukon Liu, are collaborators on this discussion. You will see why I needed collaborators to do the discussion, because it's actually going to be uh, pretty extensive <clears throat> in, in its scope. So let me uh, start where uh, uh, Professor Shore uh, took off, and the core of the paper as I see it, is in the in the following in the following statement: is that retail crypto investors view price movements as indicator in the changes of probability of future adoption of uh, cryptocurrencies. This is the core observation around which many other things are built, including momentum momentum effect. So, if the likelihood of adoption increases when the price goes up, this price movements can have the an amplification effect. So that's the direct <coughs> quote from. From the paper. So what I'm going to do in uh, this discussion is uh, to significantly generalize uh, the scope of uh, Antoinette and co-authors uh, hypothesis and corroborate it in two significant directions. First, I'm going to start with the coin market and I'm going to show how the results play in a broader set of coins. Uh, second, and more substantially, I'm going to show how uh, the results play out for a variety of other 
proxies for adoption and for network value, like number of users, addresses, transaction count. <clears throat> so this is going to be the first part of the discussion is uh, focused on the cryptocurrency market. The second is I'm going to look at uh, the universe of transactions in the non-fungible tokens markets. And the, based on the transactional level for that market, where we can observe very detailed information, such as the identity of the buyer, seller, exactly where, where the first time um, a buyer, first time seller, and so on, using this identity and using this granular information, uh, I'm going to also show how the results, in fact, become even stronger for, uh, for this market. So let me start <clears throat> with uh, cryptocurrencies. Uh, so let me describe first the empirical specification of uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you some uh, some tables. So the empirical specification is what uh, uh, I'm going to do is I'm going to look at the data for top 15 coins by market capitalization. So beyond Bitcoin, Ethereum, and Ripple. And I'm going to look at the data from 2015 to 2023. So it encompasses a slightly longer uh, time horizon on which we have the detailed data. I'm going to look at three measures of adoption. I'm going to look at the changes in the new addresses. I'm going to look at the changes in the active addresses. And I'm going to look at the changes in the transaction counts. So the new addresses are a very good measure to capture the new things that are happening. Active addresses are important because a bunch of the addresses are dormant or not used. And transaction counts hopefully capture some form of trading behavior or some form of maybe non-hoarding behavior <coughs> in the in the cryptocurrencies. So some of these results, we'll also have a paper with, uh, with Yukon and Xi on uh, looking at the uh, different measures of adoption. So I'm using some of the insights from there as well. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to look at these measures of adoption and I'm going to look at their relationship to contemporaneous and lag returns at different, at different horizons. So and this is the daily data here. So let's look first at, uh, at uh, Bitcoin and let's look uh, whether uh, returns, returns one week back, one month, three months, six months, whether they are associated with higher adoption as measured by active addresses, new addresses, or transactions. And we see that contemporaneous returns, in fact, have a very strong uh, association with higher adoption exactly as uh, the paper uh, the paper argues. The rest of the results are typically positive, but uh, but not significant if we if we go back <clears throat> in terms of uh, going back in terms of time. So this is for uh, for Bitcoin. So now the second thing I'm going to do is I'm going to have a panel of 15 coins, which is going to stack them together and I'm going to have uh, fixed uh, effects, coin fixed effects and uh, without coin fixed effects. <clears throat> and we're gonna actually redo the same exercise. I'm gonna have returns and returns uh, from one week back going to six months. So again, the results are corroborated for the, for the panel of top coins in terms of contemporaneous returns. There's something slightly going on at uh, one week uh, back horizon in this panel. The rest of the results are uh, more or less uh, positive, but insane, insane effect. So broadly, I take this that uh, certainly the results that uh, Professor Shore presented uh, generalize to the broader panel of uh, cryptocurrency measured in, in, in terms of uh, new addresses, active addresses, and transaction, transaction counts. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to do a very similar exercise, identical de facto exercise of what is done in the paper. I'm going to break the sample into the days with positive returns and the days with, uh, with the negative returns and see exactly whether these measures of adoption actually are increasing together with the returns. So this is what happens if I have, again, the panel of top 15 coins, but I look at the days <laughs> when return is positive. So again, we see the contemporaneous uh, correlation. And broadly, we see the, the, the returns are being positive, but uh, the, significance, the significance is less if we divide it into this uh, two subsamples. And uh, the other way around, I'm gonna look at the days when returns are negative and we see broadly, uh, broadly sim <laughs> similar uh, patterns. The results are somewhat imprecisely uh, estimated with the exception of the transaction counts where we have the uh, the statistically significant uh, association relationship. 
All right, so I'm going to throw in one more thing, which I think is, is useful to look at. Uh, so far, we just looked at the raw measures of uh, adoption, and we looked at the raw measures of return. What if we'll look at something somewhat more sophisticated, which is some measure of value? So how do you measure value in cryptocurrency? I mean, there's obviously no earnings. But uh, what we're interested in is some relationship of the current price to some form of fundamental value. So we have done a bunch of stuff of trying to see what, what is a reasonable measure on this and in, in, in some of our work. But uh, the key conclusion there is that uh, it's useful to actually look at the measure, of which is price to new address ratio, and uh, to see whether the price to new address ratio, the coins with high price to, to new address ratio are associated with the higher number of uh, new addresses being created. So here we do just the Fama Macbeth. So basically just uh, look at first that just the raw measure of the coins with high price to earning ratio, whether they indeed have a higher adoption. And this is actually, by the way, a large sample of coins. So this is about 150 coins. So we just uh, have redone the, uh, the analysis for that. And then we also say whether uh, the similar relationship between adoption and price or measure of value whether it's true conditioning on other factors that drive a cryptocurrency market. And these are the three factors that are also from our work, the beta, uh, the cryptocurrency beta, the cryptocurrency size, cryptocurrency size, cryptocurrency momentum. And even if you put all of them together, the, the some measure of value, price to earning, or price to, sorry, price to new address ratio, that seems to be associated with the higher, the higher adoption. So this concludes my first part. And uh, what I have done is I have corroborated the results on a different set of data, on a different set of transaction measures, and also in a, in a broader sample, both in terms of time and a broader sample in terms of the data, in terms of the, the number of the coins and broader the results, uh, the results stand with some minor promises here. So hopefully this is already useful for, for, for the authors. So let me do the, the second exercise, just because we can. Uh, so uh, I'm going to also do the same stuff for NFT data. So uh, for the NFT data, uh, we have collected uh, the essentially the universe of uh, the NFT transactions. Uh, and uh, we have complete history of transactions, exactly who trades what. So basically everything. So we can basically do the same thing as what uh, uh, Professor Shore does with co-authors on eTOR, but using NFTs. NFTs are also interesting because one can think about them as sort of the earlier uh, version of crypto or crypto in the earlier ages. So which is also jibes well with the, the data sample for, uh, for Antoinette's work. So for NFTs, we have to do a little bit more work, which I do in this discussion. So first of all, uh, the measure of returns because NFTs are non-fungible. So there are a bunch of them which are very different. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take, I'm going to create the index for the NFT market using the repeated sale methodology overall. And I'm going to create indices for individual prominent collections using the repeated sale methodology. Think about this as Case-Shiller index uh, of a sort, but for the, uh, for the NFTs. And then I'm going to look at whether there is a relationship between adoption and contemporaneous or lagged uh, returns. So here I have the data for uh, eight prominent collections, board eight, CryptoPunk, Decentraland. We looked at about 5 million transactions for, uh, for this discussion. There are fewer of them uh, highlighted here. Again, I can, talk about, uh, I can talk about the details of this. So these are the data at weekly frequency from 20, 2019 to actually, to actually a month ago, so to 2023. Um, and uh, what we have is here we have slightly more nuanced again, just to throw in something a little bit more interesting, a different uh, different type of data in in the mix. We're going to look at first time buyers for a given collection. We're going to look at the number of NFTs that are bought for the first time for a collection, and we're going to look at the transaction um, total transaction in a given collection. An explanatory variable is going to be again the lag returns first to a fourth uh, week. So this is how it uh, plays out. So this is the pooled collection data. And uh, this is, again, so these are three measures, uh, the, the first time buyers, the first time in the collection, and the number of the transactions, the lag returns. And here, actually, I don't know, surprising to us. So here, the returns are actually 
even stronger. So basically everything is positive, not only on the contemporaneous returns, everything has the right size and everything uh, uh, going back to, uh, to four weeks back is, uh, is, is, is a strong return. So, so this is kind of nice. So this is a completely different data, similar in style. And the results are the results are actually even stronger here. So again, I think this uh, strongly corroborates the hypothesis in the paper, but on a different but related day. Uh, also, I'm going to do exactly the same things as, as I done in the discussed paper. I'm going to break into the positive. I'm going to break into the negative uh, return days, and I'm going to look at uh, at the adoption. So again, here we have statistically significant returns for the positive days. Uh, so it's the same thing, but everything is statistically significant. Uh, interestingly, however, if we look at the days with the with the negative returns, the association is uh, is somewhat somewhat weaker. So the positive, the contemporaneous association is statistically significant, but the rest of the association is is weaker. So at least it suggests that there is a different behavior of NFT investors on the days of positive. Uh, versus uh, versus negative negative returns. Um, I like NFTs, so these are also the data for each individual collection. CryptoKitties, the central land crypto punk uh, board ape. The results are necessarily a little bit weaker because there are just fewer observation uh, there. Uh, mutant ape, subduck, rareable, and uh, and cool cat. And uh, coefficients are basically mostly positive, uh, consistent with the panel estimates but the results are less precisely uh, estimated. So just to summarize, what we have done is we have taken a broader set of cryptocurrencies, broader set of adoption measures. One, the results are corroborated. There's some interesting stuff going on if you look uh, with the bigger magnifying glass. And then we have the ultimate magnifying glass. We have the universe of uh, NFT transactions. And uh, we show that actually the results are uh, even stronger uh, in uh, that data. Uh, compared to uh, to the original paper by the authors. So I think uh, the hypothesis is right. It's corroborated in two different dimensions. Uh, made me think about this interesting stuff. And uh, thanks again to Nicole and Yukon who actually spent a lot of time trying to crank out this uh, these details uh, of the um, uh, of this uh, of this discussion. So I'm gonna stop share and we can uh, go back to. Well, <clears throat> thank you so much uh, for this wonderful discussion, Ali. And um, I think we now have time for broader questions uh, from the audience. And um, maybe before we sort of go to general questions, Antoinette, if you want to take a few minutes to to answer uh, for, for Ali's discussion. Well, um, well, let me say thank you very much for, um, you know, kind of that really cool discussion and obviously all the work um that that you um and your co-authors have um have done on this i find that you know kind of it's really interesting I, the way i see these results the results is like in in some sense you're saying that our the retail investors are kind of right right to to think about to update um on cryptocurrencies in these kind of momentum like ways because um it does indeed seem that adoption itself reacts to past prices um and i i think i thought it was particularly interesting um your breakout um in the nft market that you know where, where you can see first time buyers versus um you know kind of in a way like intensive versus extensive margin and if i you know kind of you, you showed me the slide in the morning so i did have a, a chance to look at it i think it's kind of also cool the fact that this is asymmetric on the adoption, I think is neat. And it seems asymmetric also on the, in particular on the first time, you know, kind of adopters in bad times, right? They are really reacting to it. You don't see as much in a way on the existing, um, you know, investors not trading at all, right? In NFT in, in bad times, right? I'm mean, now talking about this, you know, cross, Term. And so I think that tells us maybe also something more about how the network externalities might play itself out in the longer run, because, you know, maybe on the extensive margin, a lot of people indeed come in when the returns are good, they don't necessarily just drop out 
when the returns are bad. Um, but you know they will probably start being more muted um, and and doing less. Um, now in our data, right? Because we are looking at how these people then trade their portfolio shares in anticipation of adoption. At least so far, it looks more symmetric. Um, so they seem to react to the bad and the 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 bad and the good returns in a symmetric way. The truth is that you know we only have data through nine, 2019. Um, and it would be really interesting to see, you know, kind of post 2020, right? Maybe they became also more sophisticated. Let me stop here and I see um, Marcus and, and Mariam have their yeah. hands up. All right. So I'm I'm gonna call on Mariam and then Marcus, my my two co-organizers for the first two questions. Okay, so my voice might be cracking. So then I will stop and Marcus, you should do it because I'm on the train. So I thought, I thought this thing that you mentioned right, right now discussed with Ali was very interesting that, I mean, I always, I mean, I'm not an asset pricer, but I always thought about a momentum <clears throat> as actively trading along the price. But these guys basically sit back and allow the price to go up. But interestingly, because from what Ale showed, it's actually new entrants that come in and push the prices up. So it's a little like we think when we think about the housing crisis, we're like, okay, people bought houses and then prices went up and then they push the incumbents, push it up and then it crashed. But these are kind of a new adoption and it might be, as you said, Antoinette, they're right. So do you think about it like in a sense, we in can a sense, argue you just to let me know. In a sense, that's like a little bit um, different from what I thought as momentum. So that's very fair. Let, I think you're actually asking two things. Um, so on the one, so let me do the momentum. You're right. I mean, so we call it in the paper momentum like <laughs> because you know it, you're right that they are not actively trading momentum. They're just holding through the price movements. Now they are. The reason why we don't want to call them buy and hold, and sorry for all the semantic, is because they're not holding for years and months, right? These are still they are day traders, if you want, or you know, kind of retail traders. So on average, even those guys hold for like two weeks to like maximum, you know, kind of uh, three weeks actually on average, and and the median even lower. That's why you know, kind of the weird, you know the weird naming, but you're completely right, right? That the way they become momentum is that they don't seem to want to you know, actively trade against the run-up and the and the reduction. Um, now on the, the second thing actually you asked, um, which goes back to Anne's paper, you know, our guys here are really small. We're not trying to, they are just price takers. We are not trying to argue that their trading is driving the price because, you know, they, they are really quite minimal. That's why it is so neat that Ale kind of shows that, you know, kind of in the, when you look at broader movements in and out of maybe people who will matter more, especially, you know, these people at the extensive and intensive margin, that they're exactly going in this direction. Um, and then finally, you know, we are also not arguing because we all don't have a great model of the level of crypto pricing, right? We're not trying to say that, oh, these people are completely irrational and they get, you know, the level of the valuation right, right? But in the they are in the in that direction. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much for the great presentation and discussion. Um, I have essentially three suggestions or clarifying comments. The first one is of how to interpret what these retail investors do in the sense like, well, they might have other accounts and I, I'm not exactly sure, you know, how, how you, you know, what kind of information we have about what fraction of their wealth might be traded on this platform or other accounts, etc. And related to this, it seems that the trades are relatively small, like $200. So when I think about stock trading for your retirement account, you have much different magnitudes. So that comes back to maybe they view this as a game or they, they use a different type of perspective for these types of trades compared to other trades that they have in different accounts. So it's just more a question of how to interpret it. And another comment is about um, a suggestion of an additional type of analysis. Um, so when you essentially look at correlations between um, 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 changes in uh, the shares and returns, 
And we know that a lot of these dependencies between variables are nonlinear. And in particular, when you look at dependencies with returns, you know, there's some outlier returns that can drive correlations. A very simple analysis would be a form of double sorting. I mean, you can have like quintiles for share changes, quintiles for return um, buckets. And I would assume that the most extreme return changes might drive the results. And it would also be insightful, you know, to have this more nonlinear relationship. And if you want to include controls, you can simply do what you do, but you have dummy variables. Instead of returns as one variable, you have dummies for different buckets of returns. Right. And the last point um, is about, it's related to that in asset pricing returns are understanding dynamics and returns seems to be complicated and we don't only have momentum we also have reversal so essentially there are certain aspects even if you know that for a short time period you have an uptrend momentum then it can reverse so it might be insightful to understand better the overall dynamic so if you look at a longer horizon and sometimes this momentum you know momentum in asset pricing is defined in a complicated way because the last week seems to be different or the last month is different from months 12 to two months ago you know um so again i'm just wondering if you can provide more insight if there might be more complex dynamics going on yes i mean thank you these are great you know comments um let me go from the back um so we tried a little bit looking at different sub periods you know where where you know kind of there were, where were steeper run-ups um in um in crypto pre-2017 you know kind of was this period where there were very non-linear run-ups um and so we look at these sub periods and we see that the results are relatively similar um within these different periods but you're right we can do more to kind of in a way i think what you have in mind is to parameterize maybe a bit more the return dynamics um, you know, kind of further out. Um, this, the second from the last thing you said, we did actually do the double sorting. So we, we do look at, um, you know, quintiles of extreme returns and then middling returns um, because we, we were worried that, you know, maybe in crypto where there are these extreme returns, all the results are in the extremes. But actually we find it across the distribution and the same in a way for the stocks. One thing actually that we tried which is also was important to us. You know, there's some recent work by Luis Vicera and Enriqueta Ravina that seems that suggests that retail traders in stocks trade momentum in particular, uh, or most of, sorry, not momentum, tra trade contrarian in particular around earnings announcement states, and that a lot of the contrarianism is in those events. And actually, so we, we replicate this, but of course we don't have this for crypto, right? There are no earnings um, announcements, but we do see that the contrarian behavior is much stronger for stocks around those um, earnings announcement dates. And so initially, you know, we thought hmm, maybe the difference is just dates with information is when the retail guys somehow think that they know more than the others, right? They have to be somehow believing that the rest of the market is overshooting and they are, you know, not or something like that. Interestingly, right, remember in, in gold, there are no earnings announcement states either. And still they're very contrarian in, in these things. Um, and then, sorry, what did you say? <laughs> now I'm getting becoming an old lady. Um, you said you know, different that, accounts and size of yes. The so the so well. sorry exactly. So we don't. So we have self-reported wealth of these people, um, and so we're looking at you know kind of their overall. So we did a bunch of cuts basically on people that say that they're relatively wealthy. Um, and we can see whether, you know, what they have in eToro looks like a lot versus little. And we, again, don't see a lot of different behavior. But I would completely agree with you. This is this is not people's retirement savings at all, right? I see this really more, this is day trading, discount trading, you know, yeah. Yeah. I don't, just to clarify, I don't think it's a retirement saving. I just said it's definitely different from a retirement saving. And so... 
if you think of their overall trading, maybe there's mm -hmm. certain things that are averaging out. That was my thought. Um, yeah, I mean, so the one thing we can also do, I mean, you know, so as I said, I, we can show you um, that even for wealthy versus not so wealthy people, you know, kind of we see similar. The other thing we have tried, so there are people, you know, some people have quite a lot of money on eToro and they even, eToro does allow you to invest in indices too. So you don't have to, you know, day trade. Um, there are people who have a significant fraction somewhere, I mean, in index funds, but then also trade in cryptos and individual stocks. And even for those, we see, you know, this asymmetry. Now, of course, that's a very selective sample. And so that's why we thought leaning on this maybe is, is a bit, you know, biased. Um, but I, I think, you know, the, the important thing ultimately, you know, I think what, what makes me, how to say, um, more confident that the results are meaningful, you know, the main result is meaningful is that because we can within person see that, um, you know, they trade differently across these asset classes. Um, therefore, you know, what's important to us that they seem to be updating quite different, again, about the, the um, return dynamics of crypto versus other things. Thank you so much. Uh... And a big round of uh, virtual applause to our speakers. And um, thank you again, Ale and Coatas, for the, the great. Discussion. Thank you, Antonia. So uh, we can talk more uh, if you wish, and we're happy to share the data and, and the results with you as well. Cool. Thank you. And before we enter the unrecorded part of our uh, webinar, I would like to announce our next uh, event, which is on uh, November 30th, where We'll have uh, Nikhil Agarwal from MIT uh, present his work on combining human expertise with artificial intelligence, experimental evidence from radiology. And then we'll have an actual physician, Ziad Obermeyer, discuss uh, uh, the paper. So we'll keep you updated about the details, but we're very much looking forward to, to our, our upcoming events. So please, uh, please stay in the Zoom room and then we'll upgrade you all to panelists.